up, um, we'll have um, Gregor Neuert from, he's uh, at Vanderbilt University. And Gregor did his uh, PhD at the University of Munich, I believe. Um, also, I got that wrong. And then uh, his postdoc with Alexander Van Udenarden at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, and he's run a lab at Vanderbilt for, I think, since 2012. Is that right, Gregor? Yes, that's yeah. correct. Yeah, so uh, very exciting. Yeah, uh, very exciting to um, hear about. Um, I saw Gregor give a talk last uh, summer at the FASA meeting on cell physiology and kinetic environments. And so, um, yeah, uh, Gregor, why don't you go ahead and um, uh, and start? And yeah, thanks for joining us here. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, John, for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present our research. So today, I will talk about cell physiology in kinetic environments. And um, so if you think about signaling, we know that cells can sense all kinds of different signals and these signals then need to be processed through the cell, which then can cause different responses of the cells that can lead to outputs either to feedback on the same cell or to actually regulate other cells in the environment. And these signaling processes are dictated by networks of proteins and we have learned a lot about different proteins. We have learned about what are these proteins, which of them are involved in certain diseases and for some of them we have also developed drugs. And most of this knowledge comes from experiments mostly in cell culture in which we expose cells to different concentration of a stimuli, so this could be different hormones, stressors, um, drugs or different signaling molecules. But basically what we do in these experiments is we change the environment instantaneously. And then we look for an output, a terminal signaling protein, for example, and then we plot the activity of that protein as a function of a concentration. And um, it's a concentration of either the signaling molecule, the drug, or um, is increased, then we find for example, a threshold of activation. So this would be the concentration threshold of activation. And if there is a mutation, then this could shift this concentration threshold either to a higher or lower value, making the cells sensitive or hyperactive. But we also know that in the human body, hormones are secreted in ways that may not be actually constant over time. So we can have a situation in which we have an increase or a decrease in, for example, in this case, insulin, or we could have a kind of temporal pattern, which could be uh, different pulses, but also gradual changes over time. And depending on how these molecules are secreted and then activate signaling pathways, then this can cause actually very different dynamics of basically the same protein, depending on what the pattern of external perturbation is. And this has been shown um, to be important in many different processes. EGF, NGF signaling can cause very different activities of ERK. TNF-alpha, LPS response can lead to very different responses. In yeast, for example, glucose or oxidative stress can cause different dynamics. And last week we have learned about um, P53 regulation. And these different patterns of signaling dynamics can then actually lead to very different cell phenotypic outputs. So this can lead to proliferation, differentiation, cell cycle arrest, or apoptosis. And so the question that we ask in my lab is, if environments change over time in a non-constant manner, do we actually observe different biology as if the cells would be exposed to the same stimuli, but under constant environments. And this is a very fundamental question that is basically important for all cells um, from yeast um, to human. And so we can have the situation in which, for example, we stress a cell using a rapid or instant acute stress, which is basically the paradigm of how we probe cells. This activates the pathway, which then can um, induce a stress response pathway in kind of this adaptive manner. And this stress response pathway then actually protects the cells and enables the cells to actually grow normally. But we can also have the situation where the same stress with the same final concentration and 
the same total amount of stress gets exposed to the cells, but then under this condition, the stress response pathway that should protect the cells actually does not get activated, which then can lead to cell death. Alternatively, if we do a screen, and for example, we perturb a system and we compare wild type strain to a strain in which there's a deletion and we look for the response, then usually we hope that there is a difference. But if we don't see a difference, then usually what we think is that this protein is not important for the pathway and therefore should not be very further studied um, under this kind of condition. But we could have the situation that if we would actually use a, use a different type of perturbation, then it could be that there actually is a significant difference between wild type and mutant strain. And this is important to understand, for example, if disease mutation are actually relevant in a kind of physiological context, this could be also important to understand how drugs actually function. And this could also help us to develop drugs which are much more targeted because they could distinguish between different type of environments. Will also help us to identify novel proteins which have not previously been identified in a specific pathway. And this kind of temporal pattern can be cell type specific and they can be also tissue specific. And so in the literature, there exist examples, for example, for EGF signaling, um, where people have used step pulses or RAM profiles, which then activate different downstream signaling pathways. And these signaling pathways can exhibit very different dynamics. Another example is uh, TGF beta signaling in which you can have a fast activation which causes adaptive response, but then when you have a slow increase, you get only a minimal activation or no activation at all. And so this brings me to this kind of broader phenotypic map, which I depicted here as this cube in which there's three axes which I think are important um, in biology. One is genetics, like what are the different mutations that can cause a phenotype? What are all the different molecules that can cause a phenotype? And then, and this is basically what most people study. And then we have this green axis here is how, do the, how does the environment actually changes? And usually on this axis, we use these dose response curves, which are maybe five or 10 different concentrations that people use. And we not really explore this axis. Yet we as humans live in this cube basically where we are exposed to all of these different changes. Whereas our model system usually live in this kind of purple plane. And the question is, how important is this difference? And this, will this information actually may help us to better understand human diseases and human phenotypes? So the two fundamental questions that we have in the lab is, how do individual cells respond to physiologically relevant environments? And how do protein generate dynamic behavior within a single cell? And so what we did is we used a, a phenotypic assay which consists of two stresses. The first stress are stresses of different temporal dynamics. So we have either untreated cells as a control or we have cells that are treated with a, this is in this case, it's an osmotic stress either as an instant change as a pulse, as a slow increasing ramp, or a fast increasing gradual change. In all of these three different conditions, the final concentration is the same, and the total amount of stress is also identical. After this initial stress, we either do not stress the cells or we stress them acutely with a very severe stress, and then we look for colony formation as a measure for a phenotypic readout of cell uh, death and life. And so what we basically observe is if we compare pulse treated cells versus fast increasing treated cells of the stress, then we see that the cells can survive roughly tenfold better compared to untreated cells. However, if we slowly increase to the same final stress and the same total amount of stress, we observe that cells actually do not survive so well under the slow increase in conditions. And these experiments, and this points to this initial picture what I painted before that uh, 
there are situations in which you could have actually a slow increasing stress, which then do not protect the cells. And so the question that comes from this is, how do varying rate stimuli affect signaling? And so we study um, osmotic stress in a yeast model system because in this system we have very good control over the environment and we can read out signaling um, precisely. We also know basically all the different proteins that are involved and can genetically manipulate the system precisely to really connect an observation to a molecular mechanism. And so one feature of this pathway is that when HOC1 gets um, activated up on osmotic stress, so an increase in external salt concentration, then this causes to HOC1 to no localize to the nucleus. And if one now labels HOC1 with a fluorescent protein and um, watches these, these cells under the microscope, then one can take these time-lapse movies in which individual cells are measured over time. And in red, you see the HOC1 localizes to the nucleus. And so we developed automated image processing software, which can then actually track individual cells and quantify the ratio of nuclear to cytoplasmic intensity, which is plotted here as the HOC1 nuclear enrichment. And what we find is, and what others have also found is that up on different stress, you get this adaptive behavior. And this adaptive behavior can be described in principle by an integrated feedback, integrate to feedback loop. So this integral feedback loop basically measures the relative changes between external osmotic pressure and internal osmotic pressure. And so what people have done previously is they expose cells to different salt concentration and ask at which salt concentration do you get activation. And what they found is that there is a threshold of activation of around 50 millimolar NACL or KCL um, that is required in order to activate the pathway. And this is measured here with either um, phosphor take or uh, Western quantitative Western block. And so in order to ask the question, how do rates impact um, signaling, we expose cells either to a pulse or to a quadri quadratically increasing salt concentration. And the reason we use a quadratic increase in the salt concentration is because here we can do not only a dose response for the concentration, but we can actually a dose response experiment for the rate. And so in this quadratic experiment, the rate is the first derivative, and this means that the rate linearly increases over time. And what we then observe is that HOC1 nuclear localization up on the pulse is highly activated, yet when we expose cells to this quadratically increasing salt concentration to the same final concentration, we find no activation until around 15 minutes, and then only a minimal activation. And the uh, maximum level of activation is roughly 10% of the step activation. And what you see here is a mean and standard deviation from three to five, uh, five biological replica experiments. And this shows that we can actually very precisely quantify the signaling change. We can also quantify volume change over time, which is due to the change in osmolarity. And because we measure the signaling as a function of the quadratic change, we can now actually ask the question, is there not only a concentration threshold as previously observed, but is there actually a rate threshold of activation? And we believe that at this time point 15 minutes, where we are well above the concentration threshold, we may actually hit a threshold rate condition. And this concept of a threshold rate is actually a very novel concept um, in signaling biology, which has not been really observed or described in any other system. And because we plot, we measure HOC1 as a function of the quadratic profile, we can now actually plot HOC1 as a function of the salt concentration. And we have this dose response curve for the concentration. And what we find is that there is a threshold of salt concentration of around 120 millimolar, which is significantly higher than the threshold we would get if we would use a step treatment. And so one question is why is this actually threshold of concentration threshold of activation actually higher? And because we plotted the data as, uh, we measured the data as a function of a quadratic, quadratic stimulus, we can now plot the same data as a function of the rate. And when we do that, we get the dose response for the rate of activation, 
we find that there is a minimum rate of activation of 12 millimolar per minute required in order to activate signal. And so this brings us to a model in which HOG1 activation does not only depend on the concentration, but also depend on the rate of activation. And this concentration threshold and the rate threshold are both equally important in order to activate the pathway and they act in a kind of end logic manner. So now we have made this observation, but what are the actually underlying proteins that encode this rate threshold? And there, here yeast comes very in very handy because we, we have deletion strains available um, in which we can look at upstream regulators of HOG1 kinase or downstream regulators of HOG1 kinase. And we actually screened all of these different um, deletion strains for these different proteins to ask which of them could actually modulate the rate threshold. And the idea here is that if we compare a wild type strain compared to a mutant strain and we expose cells to this quadratic profile, then we would have a concentration threshold which we would have hit first and then a, a rate threshold later. And the idea is if the protein that encodes the rate threshold is actually deleted, then this rate threshold should be vanished and we should get activation when we hit the concentration threshold shown here by the increase in the red line. And so what we found is that a phosphatase PDP2, but not a redundant phosphatase PDP3, is actually causing cells to activate signaling much earlier in red compared to the blue line for the wild type or the cyan line for the PTP3 deletion strain. So this indicates that PTP2 is potentially the sole regulator or a major regulator of the threshold rate condition. So we then um, also made use of this yeast system in which we then can actually um, Actually, let me first go to the rate threshold. So we then actually plotted the DAME data as a function um, of the salt concentration. And we find that in the PDP2 deletion, the th salt concentration threshold that need to be overcome is now around 30 millimolar compared to 120 millimolar that we had previously. And this compares very well to wild type cells which are um, exposed to step condition in which we know that the threshold concentration is around 50 millimolar. So this indicates that PTP2 deletion completely abolishes the rate threshold condition and only now the cells are left with the concentration threshold condition. Interestingly, if we use normal pulse-like activation that everyone else is using and people have used before, and we compare the wild type strain to the PTP2 or the PTP3 deletion strain, we find that the difference in signaling response is um, not really different given the error bars that we have in the measurement. So this indicates that under step condition, we would never have identified PDP2 or PDP3 as a regulator um, of this pathway. And so this indicates, this brings me to the um, one of the previous slides that I had in which I showed that the type of perturbation profile is actually important to identify novel proteins in signaling regulation and it can be completely missed if you use standard step-like or pulse-like treatments. And so we then wanted to ask how does the concentration of PDP2 is actually impacting this rate threshold? Is it that you can basically completely, um, completely disrupt this rate threshold mechanism, or is it that it's directly depending on the protein PTP2 concentration? And so for that, we use the PTP2 deletion strain and we transfect it in a plasmid that has um, the PTP2 native promoter, an ADH1 or a TEF1 promoter, which are two strong promoters that lead to overexpression of PTP2. And what we then find is that if we overexpress PTP2, we actually find an increase in the rate threshold, indicating that the concentration of the phosphatase is directly related to the rate threshold value. So this brings us to our final model in which we show that low step concentration or rates of um, slow increase 
cannot activate signaling in the hog pathway. The traditional studies that use pulsed or step-like activation above the threshold concentration fulfill the rate threshold, the concentration threshold and the rate threshold simultaneously and therefore lead to rapid activation of signaling. If we use a linear increasing um, salt concentration which fulfills the rate threshold first, then signaling will happen if the concentration threshold is overcome. But if we use a quadratic profile, then we actually hit the, rates, the concentration threshold first and the rate threshold later. And only when the rate threshold is actually fulfilled do we get activation. And so this kind of observation of a rate threshold has been also done previously because if you look here in this EGF kind of signaling profile where people use different REMs, then you find that, for example, um, EGF, AKT, or even S6 signaling dramatically changes depending on the rate of activation. And the same is, is true for TGF beta signaling in which a slow increasing ramp rate does not activate um, TGF beta signaling. And so we believe that this rate threshold mechanism is a potentially universal mechanism in systems where you have a dynamic response uh, to external environments. And so we think that this kind of dynamic environments are also a way to study phosphatases, which is an underappreciated class of proteins, which are very hard to study. And we can actually use these dynamic profiles um, to look for differential regulation of these phosphatases. And we believe that we can use these temporal profiles also to study other mutants in the pathway to ask how they actually how do specific protein affect signaling dynamics? And so on the end, I believe that if we really want to understand cell signaling in biological phenotype, we have to actually take this temporal environment into consideration to much better mimic environments that are involved uh, with uh, observed in vivo so that we can actually develop a better understanding and potentially better treatment uh, regimes. And we now have expanded this approach from yeast to mammalian cells, where we actually compare step treatment to ramp treatments. And we find that cell fate decisions is actually differentially regulated depending on how the stress is um, applied to the cell. And there's um, Alexander Timiger, graduate student in my lab, who will be happy to also present in this series. And we also believe that this kind of dynamic diverse environments are actually much more suitable for model identification. So what we did here is we used a simple four node model and we um, simulated data with this model, then fitted simulated data to steps, which is shown here in red, and then used this para inferred parameters and make prediction for diverse kinetics. And what we find is compared to the simulated data, we can even so we fit very well we cannot really predict very well. But if we train the model with diverse kinetics in which we use very different types of perturbation, we can learn much more about the parameter values and the model and therefore can actually make very good predictions um, for new data sets. And this is a, a project that is pioneered by Hossein um, in my lab who will be also on the job market in the fall and will be also happy to uh, present the research. And on the end, I like to thank the coworkers so Amanda, who was a postdoc in the lab, um, did most of the, did more or less all the work in the first part um, of the talk, which was initially pioneered by Gulian. And I also like to thank my funding sources. I'm happy to answer your questions. Great, yeah, great talk, Gregor. Uh, thank, I, I think that's a you know a great insight that um you know the dynamic inputs are are important to you know and, and you know more or less the norm in um in physiological situations um i see we've got a bunch of questions so i'm going to hold off on mine uh andrew you want to go ahead and ask your question yeah that was a great talk gregor <clears throat> um I, I was just wondering if you can comment about what the advantage would be of measuring rates versus total total levels um you know in, in the context of hog one or any other pathway <clears throat> 
Yeah, so I think that um, these are like two complementary methods to actually study the pathway. And so I think you learn different types of information from this kind of measurements. I think on the beginning, if you don't know anything about the pathway, then I think um, step treatment will be very useful. So, so I guess I was wondering, Gregor, what, what, what the advantage for the cell would be in measuring rates versus um, total level. Okay. So, I mean, I think you can, um, so the advantage would be that you could actually maybe better sense like how fast your environment is changing if you just measure if you basically measure concentrations, you would just know, okay, what is the actual value are. But if you would be able to actually measure rates, you maybe also better can anticipate what may be happening in the future, or you also be more tolerant, or you have more options maybe to make decisions actually. Yeah, it just seems like, um, you know, going back on the, the first talk, it seems like rates might be more noisy. Um, and, and so cells might, respond too quickly to rates versus an actual level. Um, that's just so we don't see this. I mean, we don't really, so I think for our system, the signaling is very homogeneous from cell to cell. So we don't actually see a lot of like variation in the, there's basically no difference in our system in terms of cell to cell variability because it's actually so low that it's below the detection limit of I think we have more variability from the segmentation than we have from the biolo biology. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, nice to think about the parallel between the two systems. It's, it's interesting. Sergio, do you want to go ahead and ask a question? Sure. Thanks. Um, so great talk. I, I have a, actually a couple of questions. It's been a long time that I don't work with this system, but I used to. So yes. <laughs> uh, one, one is, um, have you looked at, at the role of FPS1? And I'm going to explain a little bit more. So basically, the hot pathway senses membrane turgor pressure. Mm -hmm. And there is this channel of glycerol channel FPS1 that can self-close when the, the membrane is disrupted. So when you increase very slow the amount of salt, what happens is this channel closes and glycerol accumulates independently of Hog one activation. So I wonder if, if you've tried with a delete of FPS1 and uh, uh, seen how the rates are detected or not. Yeah, so we don't, we haven't tried the FPS1, but I can show you the, so if you look at this data that we have on the volume change, here on the bottom. So what you see is in blue is this volume change um, up on the step treatment. And this is basically this classical behavior um, that you just mentioned. So you have the step treatment, volume shrinks in the step, and then you slowly accumulate glycerol, which then compensates for this turgor pressure, which is due to the fact that you have this FPS1 closing um, and you keep the, we keep the glycerol inside, but if you slowly change the, the stress environment, you see that basically on the beginning here, the cells basically behave like as if they would just be treated by media. So you don't really see any change in volume. Then only later, when you get to uh, higher levels of salt, do you actually see the closer closure and the reduction of the volume. I, I think, I mean, you still want, may want to look at FPS1 because even that you don't see the change in volume, it could be that the function of FPS1 is, is uh, adapting the cells as they go without necessarily seeing a change in, in volume. Uh, yeah, very I think it's a, good, it's a good idea. Thanks. So the other question was about, um, you said you did a screen with all the proteins that were on that, on that um, cartoon or schematic, uh, did you not see any effect with SSK2 and 22? And did you delete them both simultaneously? I did only do single deletions. Ah, they are redundant. They need to be dual deletes. And because that branch is the one that senses basal signal, I think it, it may be important to do the dual delete of those. To see yeah, I think we did. Right. There's another protein, I think, upstream of that. 
that we also did, which then actually disactivate the pathway. Yeah, and great. Not see. Hmm? No, no, that's it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, er Eric, do you want to go ahead and ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, hey, Gregor, great talk. Um, kind of following up on Andrew's uh, idea a little bit. Um, I was wondering about the, the actual the specific rate that was the threshold um, for the hog pathway. Do you think that this comes about because there's something, is it due to like a rate of adaptability downstream to deal with uh, how rapid the changes of the osmolarity, or do you think it's more like intrinsic to the biochemistry for some reason of um, you know, the kinesis and the phosphatases? Yeah, I think that's a good good question. So, so I think that basically this rate threshold is basically a turning point in which signaling activation becomes higher than dephosphorylation. And um, and so I think if you go below above twelve millimolar per minute, then you have more Hog one signaling activation than dephosphorylation by PDP two, and that's why you see signaling activation. Did this answer the question? Yep, thanks. So it seems more of like kind of just the biochemistry than. Yeah, um, I think so. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, Gregor, can I ask you? So I think some of the other questions touched on this, but, the, you know, I, when I think about um, transient signals, you know, yeah, definitely rate is one important thing, but also, you know, you also have very often repeated stimuli, right? So. Yeah. And what we often see is there's you know a refractory period due to um, you know negative feedback or some kind of adaptation, um, and, it, and when I'm thinking about your ramp, it seems like while you know let's say a cell is, a, is responding to a ramp, there's there could be like two classes of uh, of things affecting that. One is like the the built-in rate detection, like you're like like you're talking about, I think, and then the other possibility is that you're like inducing the negative feedback and like the adaptation as as you go along you know and and so like you're, is there a way to separate these you know maybe with like a you know if you did like two ramps you know could you would would that be informative do you think in sort of separating possible mechanisms of um you know negative feedback versus you know rate limitation uh or rate gating yeah, so, mechanisms um so i think that Let me, yeah, I mean, let me think about this for a second. So, um, so if you remove basically hop one instantaneously, I mean, if you basically give a salt pulse mm -hmm. and you wait for, let's say five or 10 minutes before the adaptation kicks in, mm -hmm. and then you remove the salt, then hop one leaves the nucleus within like 30 seconds or something like that. Mm -hmm. So very quickly it goes out of the nucleus. And this adaptive behavior that you see here is basically due to the fact that you continuously expose the cells to the osmotic stress. And this is based on the glycerol accumulation that actually happening. Right, okay. So if you would basically pulse, for example, for 50 minutes and then Hawk one is going down and then you would pulse again, you may not get the same response mm -hmm. than what you got before. Right. Yeah, and so I think that I mean, you need to have some kind of period before you get activation. Then I think if you do this over and over, over like multiple hours, then the whole gene expression changes also kick in that may change some things. But in the short time frame that we are working on, that's not really relevant. Right. I right. mean, the gene expression is not relevant. Yeah. 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 It makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, Olivier, do you want to go ahead and um, ask a question? Yes. Thank you, Gregor, for an excellent talk. So, I was wondering, so um, you uh, use those new input-output signaling profiles to uh, do parameter uh, inference. Uh, most likely, if I understand well, you work on one of the map kind of signaling that has been mostly studied uh, in, in, in yeast, so you know um, a lot about the, yeah, the interaction within the pathway. Can you, I mean, how far can you push the identification of feedback structures in, in, in these models. I mean, uh, you, uh, and also how many different inputs would you have to test or how do you design your inputs so that they're informative about uh, identifying parameters and, and about uh, identifying models? 
Yeah, very good, very good point. So, so when you look at this uh, slide here on the right side, so what we did, so we actually, we wanted to actually ask exactly this question. So now we have all this data that we generated and we actually have generated much more data than um, I showed. And we asked, okay, can we actually do model inference with this input output relationships? And on the beginning, we wanted to use actually the original data that we measured, but actually doing model inference in a rigorous way is not so easy because you have these many parameters you have to optimize and you can always fit a model. And so what we did is we started with something simple where we approximate the hot pathway as these four nodes here. And this model has um, around 20 to 30 parameters already. And this is the most simplest way we can actually represent this. And um, just fitting the model to the data here gives you like very good fit, but gives you actually very bad predictions. And so on the, on the on, in this model, what we first do is how do we actually can do model inference in the first place? And then in the next step, we will go into this question about, can we actually learn something about feedback? So we, right now we do not really have information about how much we can learn about feedbacks, but we know that using diverse kinetics enables us to much better estimate parameters for a model like this. Uh, and so if you would go to a much more complex model, it would be actually much more difficult. Um, and how much data do we need for, for a simple model like this? Uh, we need right now five data sets um, and we have compared different steps in different diverse kinetics. And we also have used um, optimal experimental design to actually screen computationally through what is the minimum number of perturbation we need. And for that, we also um, only need five perturbations. And this is a manuscript we like have in revision right now. And it's actually on bioarchive, I think. Super, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So yeah, looks like we're just about out of time. So um, yeah, like, like last week, if you have any more questions, uh, just feel free to move them to the Q&A channel on the Slack website. Uh, if anybody has any trouble getting on the Slack, just give me an email, I can send you a link. Um, and feel free to share it with uh, other people. Uh, we're interested in expanding the community. So um, yeah, so thanks again to both Jen and Gregor. Uh, really fantastic talks, um, very interesting stuff. Um, so yeah, thanks again. I uh, hope to see you all next week. Take care, everybody. Thanks, John. Take care. Everyone else too. <laughs>